Journey of the King, Parts 8 and 9, From Time and the Gods, by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, March 2007. Time and the Gods by Lord Dunsany. Journey of the King, Parts 8 and 9. Part 8. Then said the king, I like not these strange journeys, nor this faint wandering through the dreams of gods, like the shadow of a weary camel that may not rest when the sun is low. The gods that have made me to love the earth's cool words and dancing streams do ill to send me into the starry spaces that I love not, with my soul still peering earthward through the eternal years, as a beggar who once was noble, staring from the street at lighted halls. For wherever the gods may send me, I shall be as the gods have made me, a creature loving the green fields of earth. Now if there stand one prophet here that hath the ear of those two splendid gods that stride above the glories of the orient sky, tell them that there is on earth one king in the land called Zarkandhu, to the south of the opal mountains, who would fain tarry among the many gardens of earth, and would leave to other men the splendors that the gods shall give the dead above the twilight that surrounds the stars. Then spake Yaman, prophet of the temple of Oban, that stands on the shores of a great lake, facing east. Yaman said, I pray oft to the gods who sit above the twilight behind the east, when the clouds are heavy and red at sunset, or when there is boding of thunder or eclipse, then I pray not, lest my prayers be scattered and beaten earthward. But when the sun sets in a tranquil sky, pale green or azure, the light of his farewells stays long upon lonely hills, then I send forth my prayers to flutter upward to gods that are surely smiling, and the gods hear my prayers. But, O King, boons sought out of due time from the gods are never wholly to be desired, and, if they should grant to thee to tarry on the earth, old age would trouble thee with burdens more and more, till thou wouldst become the driven slave of the hours in fetters that none may break. The king said that they have devised this burden of age may surely stay it, Pray, therefore, on the calmest evening of the year to the gods above the twilight, that I may tarry always on the earth, and always young, while over my head the scourges of the gods pass and alight not. Then answered Yaman, The king hath commanded, yet among the blessings of the gods there always cries a curse. The great princes that make merry with the king, who tell of the great deeds that the king wrought in the former time, shall one by one grow old. And thou, O king, seated at the feast, crying, Make merry, and extolling the former time, shall find about thee white heads nodding in sleep, and men that are forgetting the former time. Then, one by one, the names of those that sported with thee once called by the gods, one by one, the names of the singers that sing the songs thou lovest called by the gods. Lastly, of those that chased the grey boar by night, and took him in Orgum River, only the king. Then a new people, that have not known the old deeds of the king, nor fought and chased with him, who dare not make merry with the king, as did his long-dead princes. And all the while those princes that are dead, growing dearer and greater in thy memory, and while the men that served thee then, growing more small to thee, and all the old things fading, and new things arising, which are not as the old things were. The world changing yearly before thine eyes, and the gardens of thy childhood overgrown. Because thy childhood was in olden years, thou shalt love the olden years, but ever the new years shall overthrow them and their customs, and not the will of a king may stay the changes that the gods have planned for all the customs of old. Ever thou shalt say, This was not so, and ever the new custom shall prevail, even against a king. 
When thou hast made merry a thousand times, thou shalt grow tired of making merry. At last thou shalt become weary of the chase, and still old age shall not come near to thee to stifle desires that have been too oft fulfilled. Then, O king, thou shalt be a hunter yearning for the chase, but with naught to pursue that hath not been oft overcome. Old age shall come not to bury thine ambitions in a time where there is naught for thee to aspire to any more. Experience of many centuries shall make thee wise, but hard and very sad. And thou shalt be a mind apart from thy fellows, and curse them all for fools, and they shall not perceive thy wisdom, because thy thoughts are not their thoughts, and the gods that they have made are not the gods of the olden time. No solace shall thy wisdom bring thee, but only an increasing knowledge that thou knowest not, and thou shalt feel as a wise man in a world of fools, or else as a fool in a world of wise men, when all men feel so sure, and ever thy doubts increase. When all that spake with thee of thine old deeds are dead, those that saw them not shall speak of them again to thee, till one speaking to thee of thy deeds of valour add more than even a man should when speaking to a king, and thou shalt suddenly doubt whether these great deeds were, and there shall be none to tell thee, only the echoes of the voices of the gods still singing in thine ears, when long ago they called the princes that were thy friends. And thou shalt hear the knowledge of the olden time most wrongly told, and afterwards forgotten. Then many prophets shall arise, claiming discovery of that old knowledge. Then thou shalt find that seeking knowledge is vain, as the chase is vain, as making merry is vain, as all things are vain. One day thou shalt find that it is vain to be a king. Greatly then will the acclamations of the people weary thee till the time when people grow aweary of kings. Then thou shalt know that thou hast been uprooted from thine olden time, and set to live in uncongenial years, and jests all new to royal ears shall smite thee on the head like hailstones, when thou hast lost thy crown, when those to whose grandsires thou hadst granted to bring them as children, to kiss the feet of the king, shall mock at thee, because thou hast not learnt to barter with gold. Not all the marvels of the future time shall atone to thee for those old memories that glow warmer and brighter every year as they recede into the ages that the gods have gathered. And always dreaming of thy long-dead princes, and of the great kings of other kingdoms in the olden time, thou shalt fail to see the grandeur to which a hurrying, jesting people shall attain in that kingless age. Lastly, O king, thou shalt perceive men, changing in a way that thou shalt not comprehend, knowing what thou canst not know, till thou shalt discover that these are men no more, and a new race holds dominion over the earth, whose forefathers were men. These shall speak to thee no more, as they hurry upon a quest that thou shalt never understand, and thou shalt know that thou canst no longer take thy part in shaping destinies, but in a world of cities only pine for air and the waving grass again, and the sound of a wind in trees. Then even this shall end, with the shapes of the gods in the darkness gathering all lives but thine, when the hills shall fling up earth's long-stored heat back to the heavens again, when earth shall be old and cold, with nothing alive upon it but one king. Then said the king, Pray to those hard gods still, for those that have loved the earth with all its gardens and woods and singing streams will love earth still when it is old and cold and with all its gardens gone and all the purport of its being failed and not but memories. Part 9 Then spake Paharn, a prophet of the land of Hern, and Paharn said, there was one man that knew, but he stands not here. And the king said, Is he further than my heralds might travel in the night, if they went upon fleet horses? And the prophet answered, He is no further than thy heralds may well travel in the night, but further than they may return from in all the years. 
Out of this city there goes a valley wandering through all the world, and opens out at last on the green land of Hearn. On the one side in the distance gleams the sea, and on the other side a forest, black and ancient, darkens the fields of Hearn. Beyond the forest and the sea there is no more, saving the twilight, and beyond that the gods. In the mouth of the valley sleeps the village of Ristan. Here I was born, and heard the murmur of the flocks and herds, and saw the tall smoke standing between the sky and the still roofs of Ristan, and learned that men might not go into the dark forest, and that beyond the forest and the sea was not saving the twilight, and beyond that the gods. Often there came travellers from the world all down the winding valley, and spake with strange speech in Ristan, and returned again up the valley, going back to the world. Sometimes with bells and camels, and men running on foot, kings came down the valley from the world, but always the travellers returned by the valley again, and none went further than the land of Hearn. And Kithneb also was born in the land of Hearn, and tended the flocks with me, but Kithneb would not care to listen to the murmur of the flocks and herds, and see the tall smoke standing between the roofs and the sky, but needed to know how far from Hearn it was that the world met the twilight, and how far across the twilight sat the gods. And often Kithneb dreamed as he tended the flocks and herds, and when others slept he would wander near to the edge of the forest, wherein men might not go. And the elders of the land of Hearn reproved Kithneb when he dreamed. Yet Kithneb was still as other men, and mingled with his fellows until the day of which I will tell thee, O king. For Kithneb was aged about a score of years, and he and I were sitting near the flocks, and he gazed long at the point where the dark forest met the sea at the end of the land of Hearn. But when night drove the twilight down under the forest, we brought the flocks together to Riston, and I went up the street between the houses to see four princes that had come down the valley from the world, and they were clad in blue and scarlet, and wore plumes upon their heads, and they gave us in exchange for our sheep some gleaming stones, which they told us were of great value on the word of princes. And I sold them three sheep, and Darniog sold them eight. But Kithneb came not with the others to the market-place, where the four princes stood, but went alone across the fields to the edge of the forest. And it was upon the next morning that the strange thing befell Kithneb, for I saw him in the morning coming from the fields, and I hailed him with the shepherd's cry, wherewith we shepherds called to one another, and he answered not. Then I stopped and spake to him, and Kithneb said not a word till I became angry and left him. Then we spake together concerning Kithneb, and others had hailed him, and he had not answered them, but to one he had said that he had heard the voices of the gods speaking beyond the forest, and so would never listen more to the voices of men. Then we said, Kithneb is mad, and none hindered him. Another took his place among the flocks, and Kithneb sat in the evenings by the edge of the forest on the plain alone. So Kithneb spake to none for many days. But when any forced him to speak, he said that every evening he heard the gods when they came to sit in the forest from over the twilight and sea, and that he would speak no more with men. But as the months went by, men in Riston came to look on Kithneb as a prophet, and we were wont to point to him when strangers came down the valley from the world, saying, Here in the land of Hearn we have a prophet such as you have not among your cities, for he speaks at evening with the gods. A year had passed over the silence of Kithneb when he came to me and spake, and I bowed before him, because we believed that he spake among the gods, and Kithneb said, I will speak to thee before the end, because I am most lonely. For how may I speak again with men and women, in the little streets of Riston, among the houses, when I have heard the voices of the gods singing above the twilight? But I am more lonely than ever Riston wants of, for this I tell thee, when I hear the gods, I know not what they say. Well, indeed, I know the voice of each, for ever calling me away from contentment. Well, I know their voices, as they call to my soul and trouble it. I know by their tone when they rejoice, and I know when they are sad, for even the gods feel sadness. 
I know when over-fallen cities of the past, and the curved white bones of heroes they sing the dirges of the gods' lament. But, alas, their words I know not, and the wonderful strains of the melody of their speech beat on my soul, and pass away unknown. Therefore I travelled from the land of Hern till I came to the house of the prophet Arnanyo, and told him that I sought to find the meaning of the gods, and Arnanyo told me to ask the shepherds concerning all the gods, for what the shepherds knew it was meet for a man to know, and, beyond that, knowledge turned into trouble. But I told Arnanyo that I had heard myself the voices of the gods, and knew that they were there beyond the twilight, and so could never more bow down to the gods that the shepherds made from the red clay which they scooped with their hands out of the hillside. Then said Arnanyo to me, Natheless forget that thou hast heard the gods, and bow down again to the gods of the red clay that the shepherds make, and find thereby the ease that the shepherds find, and at last die, remembering devoutly the gods of the red clay that the shepherds scooped with their hands out of the hill. For the gifts of the gods that sit beyond the twilight, and smile at the gods of clay, are neither ease nor contentment. And I said, The god that my mother made out of the red clay, that she had got from the hill, fashioning it with many arms and eyes, as she sang me songs of its power, and told me stories of its mystic birth, this god is lost and broken, and ever in my ears is ringing the melody of the gods. And Arnanyo said, If thou wouldst still seek knowledge, know that only those that come behind the gods may clearly know their meaning. And this thou canst only do by taking ship and putting out to sea from the land of Hern, and sailing up the coast towards the forest. There the sea-cliffs turn to the left, or southward, and full upon them beats the twilight from over the sea, and there thou mayst come round behind the forest. Here where the world's edge mingles with the twilight, the gods come in their evening, and if thou canst come behind them, thou shalt hear their voices clear, beating full seaward, and filling all the twilight with sound of song and thou shalt know the meaning of the gods. But where the cliffs turn southward, there sits behind the gods of Brimdono, the oldest whirlpool in the sea, roaring to guard his masters. Him the gods have chained for ever to the floor of the twilight sea to guard the door of the forest that lieth above the cliffs. Here, then, if thou canst hear the voices of the gods, as thou hast said, thou wilt know their meaning clear. But this will profit thee little, when Brimdono drags thee down, and all thy ship. Thus spake Kithneb to me. But I said, O Kithneb, forget those whirlpool-guarded gods beyond the forest, and if thy small god be lost, thou shalt worship with me the small god that my mother made. Thousands of years ago he conquered cities, but is not any longer an angry god. Pray to him, Kithneb and he shall bring thee comfort, and increase to thy flocks, and a mild spring, and at the last a quiet ending for thy days. But Kithneb he did not, and only bade me find a fisher ship and men to row it. So on the next day we put forth from the land of Hern in a boat that the fisher folk use, and with us came four of the fisher folk who rowed the boat while I held the rudder. But Kithneb sat and spake not in the prow and we rowed westward up the coast, till we came at evening, where the clouds turned southward, and the twilight gleamed upon them and the sea. There we turned southwards, and saw at once Brimdono, and as a man tears the purple cloak of a king slain in battle to divide it with other warriors, Brimdono tore the sea. And ever around and around him, with a gnarled hand, Brimdono whirled the sail of some adventurous ship, the trophy of some calamity wrought in his greed for shipwreck long ago, where he sat to guard his masters from all who fare on the sea. And ever one far-reaching empty hand swung up and down, so that we durst go no nearer. Only Kithneb neither saw Brimdono nor heard his roar, and when we would go no further, bade us lower a small boat with oars out of the ship. Into this boat Kithneb descended, not heeding words from us, and onward rode alone. A cry of triumph over ships and men Brimdono uttered before him, but Kithneb's eyes were turned toward the forest as he came behind the gods. 
Upon his face the twilight beat full from the haunts of evening to illumine the smiles that grew about his eyes as he came behind the gods. Him that had found the gods above their twilight cliffs, him that had heard their voices close at last, and knew their meaning clear, him from their cheerless world, with its doubtings and prophets that lie, from all hidden meanings, where truth rang clear at last, Brimdono took. But when Paharn ceased to speak, in the king's ears the roar of Brimdono, exulting over ancient triumphs and the whelming of ships, seemed still to ring. End of Journey of the King Parts 8 and 9